want these robots to look like they fit in the real world and look like it's it's photo real right now. Wait, the only thing that looks a little winky is that thing. It just looks like a... Too thin? Or... Yeah, it just looks like surgery equipment. All right, cool. Okay, guys, that's about all the time. It's 12 well, o'clock. Time to go. Time to go. Time to go. Right here. I got a lot more shit, dude. You can't abuse me. You're abusing me. It's abusing my time. That was the plan. You're taking advantage. Oh, in terms of our effects, we had Industrial Lights and Magic that were heading up Transformers, and we had Digital Domain, which is an effects company that I recently purchased. Both companies did the work for this movie. It's a bad dream. ILM did uh, three quarters, and Digital Domain did the last quarter. For us in the visual effects world, having giant robots to animate had a lot of really great potential, something to really look forward to. They assembled a great team up there. I heard we were the show that everyone wanted to be on because there were just tons of Transformer geeks. So it was like a mob session to get onto this show. I thought I was a huge fan, but some of the people I've met here since we got the project just you know, blow me away. You know, compared to some people out there, my collection is, is nothing. There's people who have Ten times what I have. I'd, I'd estimate I have about six or seven hundred, I think. Working on this movie has been uh, this great full circle experience for me, going from playing with the toys as a kid to getting to uh, be a part of the movie version. Once we're awarded the job, we start developing what the robots really will look like. What are all the pieces going to look like? And we start having modelers here at our place start modeling those things because it takes a good four, five, six months to build one robot. Michael wanted a level of realism that required us to go much, much, much further with the complexity of the robots. For instance, I've got a little transformer that's on my desk. He has 51 pieces in him. Our Optimus in the movie has 10,108 parts that all have to be handmade. It's in the computer but it gives you some idea of the level of complexity. They take photographs of real automotive parts and they kind of scale things in. All the Decepticons and Autobots together were about 60,000 pieces that all had to move. If a frame has three robots in it, it takes 38 hours to render one frame of film. Nowadays, I'm doing less and less storyboards, and animatics are just becoming a better tool. It's basically a Saturday morning cartoon of the movie. From that, they'll show us what's going to happen. You can work out some very complicated camera moves, especially when you're working with a height difference of 28 feet, 40 feet. So you automatically start embracing ideas of animation and physics and trying to incorporate that in your little mini movies. It's a different process of filmmaking. This is the first film with Michael Bay that I've actually worked on where the animatics carry as much weight as the script. Watch out! Michael is the genius at making these movies, and he knows when it's going to be live, and he knows when it's going to be visual effects. He likes to split it up where it's partially visual and a lot of live action. Action! A lot of directors don't like to go that way because it's easier to go the visual effects route. The great thing about Michael is he tries to get so much in camera. Five, four, three. Because what we like to do is take our visual effects and really supplement what's possible to film. But the more real stuff that he has in each shot, the more believable it's going to be. And ready in three, two, one, jump. The big challenge with Transformers is that we were working a lot with robots that weren't really there. The robots got 15 foot long feet, you know, and eight feet wide. So you have these huge things that you have to tell the camera people about, tell the set people about. You can't have it that close. He's filling this whole volume. You know, you try telling that to the guys when they arrive on set, and it's like, what? At first, everybody was kind of in shock. What, he's that big? But we had simple tools on set. We have our blueprint, the animatic. We have our cheat sheets, all the size of the robots. They would bring these poles in and everything else is acting and working around this, this pole that will soon be a, a robot. We're literally using window washer poles to act with, you know, and it's, it's a tough thing. You gotta be in love with a pole. You know, that's been a stretch for me. It's a different form of acting. Can you talk? 
XM Satellite Radio, 130 digital channels and non-stop commercial free music, news and entertainment. So you talk through the radio then, right? And a mighty voice will send a message summoning forth visitors from heaven. We all became immediate fans of Shia LaBeouf because our robots are worth nothing if the actors don't interact with them properly. Every day, all day long, my dialogue was with the A camera operator. Okay, roll on them. Go to profile. And our dialogue is with Michael all the time. Let's plan this. And you work out what the move will be. Yeah, you're right where, right where, where Shia you, was. You're backing up, and we're going to go three, two, one. You're going. And the thing is, like, you're backing up like this on the ground because you're seeing it kind of go up in front of you, all right? It was a learning curve, I must say. They got much better at it. The surprising thing with a crew is how quickly they learn. I'm trying to help them imagine the unimaginable. Pretty soon, everybody starts to believe that they're there. And then you guys are going to crawl back that way. You don't want to get Yeah, you don't want to get squished. Oh, oh. Michael was very insistent about the robots being energetic and being able to do all these acrobatic stunts. We wanted to have fighters and guys that could maneuver in ways that you'd never seen before. We went into this development phase of showing how agile we could make the robots and still convey a sense of weight. And we found that the closer things got to camera, the faster they could move. But when you see the entire robot at a further distance, we had to really slow things down to help sell their weight. I used real stunt fighters. We do fight choreography. <laughs> With Kenny's guys that were great fighters, a different type of ninja type moves. What we did was create a fighting style that represented the characters of each robot. We would video okay. these fights, not mocap, and it would help the animators get their kind of movements down and how we wanted to execute certain fighting scenes. More than anyone, the animators um, are so involved in bringing these characters to life. And the nice thing is, you know, Michael's open to feedback. I'd give him a lot of freedom. So what do you think? What do you think Optimus would do? And they all know Transformers, you know, forward and backwards. And, you know, and you'll see things in the movie that reference, like, the old cartoon because they were such big fans of it. Come on, Decepticon, punk! We've learned Earth languages through the World Wide Web. We get, had to get into Michael's head about who these characters were. Believe it or not, it's just, it's very hard to animate any type of emotion from a robot if you don't have things that move. Michael stressed to us how important it was to uh, get the performance to read in the eyes. The majority of the performance is sold in the eyes. The more we added, it just made it more real and felt like there's a soul in there. My name is Optimus Prime. We are autonomous robotic organisms from the planet Cybertron. We have a lot of transforming robots. I think originally we started with 15 transformations. We have over 40 now in the film. In the original cartoon, you could have robots kind of transform midair, and you really wouldn't care about laws of physics. This was almost too easy. Every single transformation in this movie is done as if these transformations were actually taking place in real space and in real time. There's not too many people in the world that could have figured this out. You know, it takes a real genius to be able to uh, disassemble these things and put them back together in a different shape. Yeah, we didn't want to uh, have metal actually change shape. We wanted to find a place for it on the vehicle and find a place for it that corresponded with the robot. We would really play to camera, like have all the important pieces show up, move, rotate, and go back while we were shuffling a bunch of cards behind the scenes. And the Optimus transformation, this is the camera move. And what we would do on set is we would put a pole representing Optimus's height. And that's what we start with. Uh, the next thing we do is we, we match the camera move on the computer. So this is what Optimus would look like if he were just standing in the shot um, on the ground. So this is the, the transformation you take. So it's all happening right in front of camera, in front of the audience's eyes. And you can see the, the detail. We go to the, the final render take. You know, there's cast car parts, there's engine pieces, there's gears, there's the headlights, the trailer hitch, it's tire. They could do whatever they wanted to each individual part.
friends of mine that are not in this business are always kind of uh, nonplussed when I tell them that we have to, in a computer, completely recreate every single situation that we're shooting in. What that means is our match mover, he's got to be able to come back here and completely reconstruct that in the computer because the computer doesn't know where anything is. We have spatial marks out on this area, and this, then Duncan, of course, measures these ones later on. We know exactly where these spots were because we have to rebuild it wherever he makes contact with either the ground or the objects around. So when you see these guys stand on things and sit on things and bang against things, even the buildings that are, you know, 10 stories tall all have to be mapped and measured on set. There's a lot involved in, in making these vehicles and robots look real. We would go out and take pictures of the tire tread. The treads on our Optimus are the same as the treads on the real truck, you know. And the detail down to the smallest bolt or the, the engine block, all that stuff, we were very meticulous. You want to see a car driving on the road and see it transform and, and, and watch it and say, well, those are real car parts. And to me, that that's always the most fun and most challenging thing is, can we make this stuff look real? We did a huge packages of like texture reference oh, and abrasion reference for even the robots internally because we didn't want them to be so squeaky clean that they were uninteresting. So on his hand, the surface was perfectly smooth and then we add in these scratches and nicks and dings. The hardest part about this film is we don't have real robots, we have real cars and the real cars they're buffing. You look at a real car that's just been washed and polished and shined up, and it almost looks like a CG car. So the hard part was trying to find a balance of dirt and aging to add to the robots that didn't make it look implausible that they could have come from this very clean car. So all the car paints have multiple layers. They have a colorful layer, which is right here. You see yellow reflections in here, but there's also a clear coat on top of it, which is supposed to protect it, but it also gives you uh, a really white reflection. So you always see a colorful reflection next to a white reflection. Probably two years ago, we couldn't do this movie because of lighting and ray tracing, which is a way you light things. We spend a lot of time getting the lighting right. It's very complicated to get all the specularity. Because I'm a lighting buff, you know, and, and, and especially shooting so many car commercials. I would give dissertations at ILM of like, okay, if you see a car, it's gonna have a hot spot, it's got flat here, it's got more hot spots, it's got a long highlight there, and it's, like, it's very confusing when you look at it. It's not like just one soft light on the car. So they had to really invent how to light these things so complicated to make them look like they're moving and it's like reflecting car parts in a real world. And so we're always trying to add that in and we're trying to give that sort of look to our robots and um, adding glints in what he calls pings, you know, where you highlight certain areas. These tiny little lights that are being reflected in the surfaces is what he's after. That was so interesting for us that I think we, most of us lighting people became road hazards because we're driving around looking at other cars. The robots are shiny. They have glass, they have metal, they have painted surfaces. The entire environment has to reflect. So every single shot has an environment recorded for it that gets now projected onto the robot. Otherwise, it will look phony baloney. We apply everything that we've gathered from set, which is really high resolution environments and everything is being reflected in the car panels and obviously these robots are moving around a lot so we're getting a lot of reflective play on the surfaces and there are major major light sources in here from the headlights there's the over overhead balloon there are the the eyeballs in there which have to be glowy the blinking lights we have the blinker right here and then the the face and his mouth talking is being reflected in the of the car, and that is what really sells it at the end. That's sort of the icing on the cake for us. Our job and our task to create the illusion that everything was just shot on the same day and that, you know, these robots who aren't even real were there. ILM is known for its really fabulous level of compositing. And these guys just look at the shot as artists all day long judging whether or not that thing looks like it's really in there. We start with a background plate, obviously, that's shot in production, and then we take computer-generated elements and we add them to the shot. Michael is the type of guy that wants to shoot things messy, which I love, because you shoot the explosions or all the debris or anything on set. It makes it harder for us, but it's real. 
instance, let's say the bomb goes off next to the robot. We have to model the robot, but then we have to pull out that debris out of the plate and put him in there behind it because he's got to fit into the background, but behind that debris that might be gone. It's very much a process for the compositor to get in there and make everything feel real again. And that's what those guys do. They, they attack the shot and take it to the point where it's finished. Fire! We shot a plate of the real helicopter, but in this case, it ended up being easier just to remove that helicopter. This is what the background plate was. We essentially removed the real helicopter and then replaced it with our own. So here, the compositor is actually added in the helicopter um, layered the so soldiers back over the top, um, added in some bullet hits for when uh, the soldiers actually fire and hit blackout, and then enhanced muzzle flashes in some cases to try to just bring out the, the visual excitement of the scene. And then in the background here where we had you know, previously a blank tarmac, we've added more soldiers and just more firing as a, as a texture of excitement just to, to uh, make it look like they're hitting them sort of with everything they've got. God. Everyone is just amazed at what they've done with the robots in terms of just how real it looks, how complicated it is. When you finally achieve a look where it really looks real, that's it. That's the biggest excitement of the day. There are definitely days when we go in and we review the shots and one comes up and you just say, whoa, you know, that's incredible. Like, it looks like a, a real transformer. That takes a high degree of artistry and technical support to make these things look that way. Hey, it's Lisa here with some behind the scenes trivia. Now, the first recorded use of special effects as we know them was done in 1857 by Oscar Rieslander. He took 30 different photo negatives and combined them into a single image. This was the first example of the montage print. Now, if you haven't already done it, remember to click here below to subscribe or on the side for more great content.